Putting down underlayment is one of the first things you do on a new roof installation. So today, we're gonna to discuss how to choose the right underlayment for your project and the best methods for installation. What is up guys, welcome to the Metal Roofing Channel. I am Thad Barnett. If you follow the channel, you know that we are in the middle of a standing seam metal roof installation series working on Adam Mazzella's house. So we're gonna take this opportunity to talk about how to dry in a metal roof. If you wanna stay up to date on that project, make sure you subscribe here. So to help me out, I have Dave Stubbs from the Sheffield Metals Technical Department. He's got years of installation experience. He really knows what he's talking about. So Dave, great to see you, appreciate you. Thanks for having me. Glad to be on the Metal Roofing Channel again. Absolutely, so first I think it's good to talk about different types of underlayments, what exists out there, and then how you should choose the right one for your application. Well, you know, when I, when I started in the business, uh, it was all about felt paper. 30 pound on the roof, 15 pound on the wall, you know, or some orchestration of that. And um, its inability to, its, its flexibility was limiting to what we were, you know, trying to accomplish. And thank goodness we've come up with some other stuff. There's some great synthetic products out there. Um, there's some great, you know, self-adhered products out there. Uh, and those include... Uh, Grace, Shark Skin. Uh, there's some stuff out there from Tamco. There's just an array of different products, and it depends on the solution that you're going for. We've come a long way. I still think there's some better means to uh, to get where we want to be as far as duration and, and flexibility. And um, you know, one of the biggest things is uh, the UVs. Uh, how long things can be out in the weather, out in the sun. When you're choosing a product for your project, what are some things you should be looking for in terms of quality? Well, specifically, you're looking at, you know, a lot of code enforcement stuff is gonna dictate what you can use or what you can't use. More importantly, what you can't use. You know, in different regions of the country, they like to use different things. And then some of the assembly, uh, you know, part of the problem is there's some different assembly theories or installations out there as far as where the insulation is, where your, uh, you know, your thermal break is, or where, where the temperature changes from within and where it uh, projects onto the assembly. Um, so there's a lot of different criteria when you're going in. Um, I prefer to use a, a, a fully adhered membrane or a fully adhered drying material on the roof. I think it equips you for a, a better product, a greater duration of time that you're gonna stay dry. It's a little more labor intensive, but what you get in the end is a lot better product, a lot more consistent, a lot less worries before you start to install your metal panels. Um, less worry after you're done, uh, you, you know what you got. So does the location, your geographical location, as you mentioned, uh, codes already, but does geographical location factor in when you're, when you're talking about fully adhered synthetic versus mechanically attached synthetic? Talk to me about that choice. All over the country is, is different criteria. I mean, you know, let's just take California. You've got, you've got coastline, you've got snow country, and you've got everything in between. And so uh, when you're dealing with, you know, coastal measures and high humidity and things like that, there is the possibility that you want some breathability. So in which case you'd want to do a synthetic underlayment. And, and maybe not a peel and stick to, to let that, the, the building breathe or let the assembly breathe, depending on that criteria in there. And then, of course, in snow country, I always suggest using the fully self-adhered uh, underlayment just for the sheer fact that it's snow. It's going to hold some snow. It's going to hold some moisture. And then you've got, you've got different uh, thermal movements. You've got different uh, thermal criteria. You've got vapor drive. Um, so that's really important to take into account when you're using a fully adhered UDL. It's, it's your best protection. So let's take a look at Adam's house, uh, what we've been working on. This is a before shot of his shingle roof. You can see he's got a couple pipe penetrations. There's a chimney there and a couple valleys. So can you talk to me about the practical steps that you need to take in order to dry in a roof? We are using Shark Skin Ultra SA, which is uh, peel and stick, fully adhered, um, underlayment. So talk to me about the practical steps you take to dry this roof in. First of all, when you're tearing something off, it's, it's really super important 
that you clean the surface in which you're going to put the new underlayment for a lot of different reasons. First, you don't want any punctures through your new underlayment from the underneath. So you want to be down any nails, remove nails, staples, clean off the entire thing. That's not something that you need to skimp on. That's something that has to be done and has to be done properly. You'll see it in every installation guide to every manufacturer of any underlayment, and it's super important. And then from there, make sure you measure the roof and make sure that you have enough underlayment. I see so many times where, oh, well, we, we got everything done except for, and it's usually the ridge, because you need to start at the bottom, you need to start at your eave line, and you want to go across in a horizontal uh, fashion. And um, so it starts at the eave and you work your way up the roof line. You actually start from the eave at a rake and work into the valley, go all the way through the valley. Uh, I say six feet um, just because uh, more is better than less. But um, it's really important you have enough underlayment and that extra roll could serve you later on in case something were to happen. It, sure. It's never a bad idea to have a little bit of extra underlayment in case uh, the metal is sharp. If you're putting a metal roof on, the metal is sharp. And it, the, the probability of you severing or slicing the underlayment is, is pretty high when you're dealing with sharp stuff, especially metal. So always a good idea to have uh, the ability to patch uh, if necessary. But start at the eave, do a horizontal and go up the roof line from, from your gable or rake uh, into the valley. Yeah, talk to me about the watershedding principle. You're saying to start at the bottom, and that's due to watershed. Is that correct? Can you talk to me about that? Yeah, absolutely. That's all about watershed. And you, you know, you've got to keep in mind how the water, the water's going to go, and it's generally going to go downhill. I mean, you've got some capillary action, but it, it's generally start at the bottom, work your way up, and that's that's kind of that lap factor going up the roof as as we go. So something that I actually take a little bit for granted that it just comes secondary nature to me. But yes, starting at the bottom, going to the top is the best way to go. And then when you get to the ridge, to the ridge or the, the peak of the roof, it goes, the underlayment goes up and over and then you lap both sides. So you actually have two layers at the ridge. And, um, you know, something to keep in mind is try to keep those as tight as possible so that you can actually see the top of the ridge. It's, it's super important to be able to identify the top of the ridge if it gets a little, you know, wonky or you get too much build up there, it's hard to define that line. Yeah. But you'll need to find that line at some point um, to do your peak flashing or or even a high eave uh, flashing. So it's always something to keep in mind to keep your dry and tight. So tell me more about the valley. Uh, can you get a little more specific on how you had finished out that valley? Uh, you said bring it over six feet, the shark skin or the whatever underlayment you're using over six feet on the valley. Talk to me more about that. There's a lot of different ways to do a valley. Um, I was, I'll, I've always been a belt and suspenders guy. Um, so I would actually uh, lay a bit of a sacrificial layer in the valley first and then run my underlayment into the valley and it goes through the valley up the other side and then the other side goes through the valley and up the other side. And you actually have three layers of protection going through the valley because a valley is is a high area for a high volume of water and the potential to leak because whether it's a if you got a you know a 412 roof a pitch of a roof 412 and a 412 pitch of the roof going into a valley it's still the easiest area to walk in and it's the easiest area for um, just traffic yeah. and so um, you really want to protect the valleys as much as possible for both traffic uh, and with your underlayment for sure so how about uh, penetrations? I see we have a chimney here. We have a couple round penetrations, a couple pipe penetrations. What do you do when it comes to those areas? Once again, you always start at the bottom and you run, um, we'll just start with the chimney. So you run up the, the face of the chimney, you run the underlayment up the wall, and then at the sides, you wrap the sides around the sides. And you have to cut it at a 45 and you, and you tab those around. Yeah. Uh, I think Sharkskin does a really good job um, with their um, instructions, they have individual details for all their all these details. They do a really good job of, of showing how to turn those corners. And so when on either side of that chimney, you turn the corners and then the underlayment on each side goes up the wall and goes over those two tabs that you've turned. Yeah. And that allows the water to get around. And on the back side, as the laps go, 
everything goes over the top of the lower. So you've got to, once again, you've got that water condition of watershed where the top goes over the lower, over the top, over the top. Yep. And how about for a round penetration like these pipes here? Round penetration is, is a little bit tough to describe. So you've got the, the round penetration and generally with your underlayment, you'll put an ax and put the pipe through. For me, really, I pref- I've always preferred um, a self-adhered underlayment, in which case you can do an X, put it over the pipe, and then you can actually cut a ribbon, um, maybe depending on the size of the pipe, and you can wrap it on the underside against the pipe and down and around and wrap it around the pipe at the lower end and do the same with the top for a watershed and then always roller it in with a, you know, a 10 pound roller or a hand roller to roll that thing into, to make it, you know, watertight. Okay. Uh, You can use some sealant around there. Um, I prefer not to use too much sealant um, just because it can be a a problem later on. We try to put the boot, um, the boot over the top of the pipe penetration. So minimizing some sealant in certain areas, um, a lot of the sealants that you use, you can't go over the back over the top of without removing them. Like silicone, not the best thing to try to go over. So um, sealant really isn't the remedy for all these different situations, but uh, a temporary seal is fine. So let's look at a couple do- other conditions here. Uh, what about when you're coming up to a, a wall, like in this particular area right here, what happens with underlayment there? You know, so often we get to projects and we're called in maybe last minute or something. And it's so important for us to get our underlayment behind the wall underlayment or envelope. We're all trying to build an envelope to where uh, whatever's on the wall, Tyvek, whatever assorted wall wrap they're using or building wrap they're using. We need to get our underlayment back behind there to develop uh, and encompass the entire envelope of the building. So that whatever, if something were to penetrate the wall, it drains out the wall and above and not behind our underlayment to let the water escape. So often we get to these jobs where it's, whether it's a re-roof condition or, or they just didn't, their sequencing was wrong. They, um, it's kind of a battle with, with metal roofing because you don't want other trades on the roof before um, or after it's done, when the, yeah. when the product's done and it, it, it looks really nice. Um, they can really torture the metal. They can really scratch it up. They can do a lot of damage to the roof um, when they're trying to put on the siding, whatever it is. And so um, predictably, we try to do a, a possibly a pre, pre-flash that we can get back to where we put some flashing in that we can attach to for the formal final finished product. Mm-hmm. Um, it's a pre-flash and then they can do their wall system and, um, and then we can execute the roof and, and the sequencing works out. Sequencing and construction is the most underrated portion of all of it. And once again, it even comes down to the basics of, of underlayment or your drying of the building. One thing that we didn't mention before on Adam's house is in, after the entire roof is dried in and the perimeter flashing goes on, um, you know, Sheffield requires another roll of underlayment to, to go over the fasteners on that perimeter flashing. Can you talk about that? It's one of our belt and suspender systems. Um, you know, underlayment's great and it has, most of them have nail penetration sealability. Mm-hmm. Most of them have that, but it's just another layer of security. If you strip that in, strip your fasteners in, um, it limits the water, it limits the condition, it limits a lot of different things that can be prohibitive to the, the metal staying attached. Um, we don't want to see, you know, a bunch of water infiltrating the perimeters. Um, that's always a, a bad thing. Yeah. Um, but if we can protect it with just a simple use of, of uh, self-adhered underlayment, uh, it's a better scenario than, than not doing it. And I know that we could go through all day about condition after condition because every roof is different you know what i mean but i'd like to take a look at at one more real quick and when you have um, this kind of roof where it comes up to a point you have four hips coming up to a point how would you deal with something like that when it comes to drying in a roof well you've got a lot of layers because every every hip is going to you're going to be on one plane you're going to wrap to the other side and same way with the other side. So you've got a lot of different back and forth on those hips. So you've got a lot of 
Um, you know, you're going to use probably twice as much underlayment as you thought you were going to use. Yep. Um, and then when you get to the top, um, I always try to do one last, one last thing on the top, one last layer on the top, kind of the, uh, the crown of the top and uh, try to cover it up. Look, the top isn't going to see that much water. There's not going to be a lot of water that's going to sit on top of there. But inevitably, somebody's going to want a weather vane up there, you know, a nice looking weather vane or something like that. Yeah. So it's always a good idea to uh, one layer is good, two layers is better, three layers might be the best. So um, I, I'm just never afraid to use more drying than what's what's necessary because um, it's it's your last effort or your last digit product to keep the water out of the building. And that's that's our end goal is to keep the water out of the building. Uh, what else haven't we talked about that you think would be important to mention about this topic? Um, I think picking out the product that best, best suits the the installation. For instance, there's a lot of different products out there that um, you think a self-adhered underlayment, it's, it's apples to apples or it's apples to oranges and it's not. Um, there's some products out there that um, might only have a five-year warranty, you know, and we're trying to do um, the best we can with the products that we have. Um, weather type warranties range as far as Sheffield, weather type warranties range from five years to 35. We don't want to specify or, or select a product that is a five-year warrantable underlayment on a 20-year roof. I mean, that just doesn't equate to a good process or a good selection of, pro of product. Um, so specifically, that is so important to align the warranty with the product. Um, you know, we, we really have kind of tied ourselves to some, some shark skin, which is fine. Uh, it's not the end all. I mean, if somebody wants to put um, a different product on there, we, you know, take it in, see what we can find on that product. We've, we found some that were less than desirable to say the least, but um, um, there's some, there's still some great products out there. It's great to I'm missing out on some of the trade shows, looking at new products. It's always exciting for me as much of a roofing dork as I am. <laughs> Uh, I still like looking at new products. I, look, I like to see what's been developing. You know, a lot of the traction, the traction stuff that's been going on with underlayments, um, you know, nothing specific as far as products, but just the, just the uh, traction that they've developed. Uh, when I first started, the Cadillac was, was Grace Ultra, you know, the Bicor product. And it's so, it's very slick. A great product, just really slick. Uh, Sharkskin's got great traction on it. There's a bunch of other products that have, wonderful traction on them and um, they, they've got some great warranties on them, but uh, it, we've come a long way. I don't know where else we can go with good product, durability, great traction, but uh, inevitably there'll be something new out there that's, that's better, lasts longer, whatever, which kind of excites me just because I'm in the business. For sure. Dave, well, thanks so much. I think we got a lot of good information today when it comes to drying in your roof and really what it takes to maintain that weatherability throughout the whole process. So if you have any questions, please comment down below. We'd love to answer them. Subscribe here to the Metal Roofing Channel. And as always, I'm Thad Barnett, and we'll catch you next time.